It's worked every time. <laughs> um, so, but, you know, the texts that we talk about are now defined not by the reader, but more by the crowd. It is a social web of texts. We curate, the four corners of the text are constrained not by meaning, but by the social networks and the social webs in which they emerge. It is no longer just a simple one-act reader. Even on the internet, we've talked about the internet expanding this notion of text. But more and we used to think of the search engine as the gateway to the internet of reading. Like that's where the bottleneck happened. But so much of the search engine and so much of what we read are defined in the spaces and that we hang out in. So the pathways aren't really defined by our social networks. They are defined more so by the tools and in the spaces. What is the capital of Virginia? Find me a, a taxonomy of search skills that say speak clearly and articulately. Because my son, he gave that face because he took two tries to get it right. But I've never seen some taxonomy of online research skills that say speak clearly and slowly to get your results. And I've never had one that said, oh, well, it's going to read. So we've got to stop preparing research in the web of yesterday and thinking more about the future of uh, the web. There we go. Um, <laughs> Because the machine gets smarter. <laughs> Society, I mean, these predictions. I remember doing this research, and, and all of a sudden, like, Google started giving kids predictions. And we're in the middle of this big IES online research grid. Like, oh, well, we can't count that because it's not in our taxonomy. Um, but the machine is going to get smarter. But our networks, more so, the pathways we pick, the learning pathways aren't determined by a source, search engine. They're based on the up, the, where we upvote, the links that we share, and how we upvote those links. So our reading pathways are now defined more in the social networks and circles that we hang out in, not so much by just our search engines. So we have to think about, where did that thing come from? Okay? And that's what you have to think about. We need self-programmable learners. People that can, you know, find the answer to the questions that they're looking for, think about the search tools that they're using, and really solve problems without instruction. Self-programmable readers is what that we're trying to get at. And that's why I come out of socially complex texts, which are texts that are uh, have different degrees of application and authority. And that so text complexity means defined by lexile, <coughs> text complexity is defined by links. And you have to think about that amplification and that authority in your instructional text. And when we think about your authority, it's where did this text come from? Who did it, who sent it? What circles did I find it from? This is critical because most people don't even read the crap that they share. They just, oh, Upworthy says I should cry if I read this, so I'm going to send it off. And so that is, you know, we have to think about where the links come from. And those texts send signals. Every time you send a link, you're sending out a social signal. And how those signals and how those links are shared determines how they're amplified. And that determines what meaning gets elevated over the noise. So how do we get kids to really understand the links and the signals that they're sending? So that amplification and that authority is critical to our instructional text. Because if you look at something like Ferguson or Gamergate or climate change, the texts are emerging all the time on the social networks. You're not going just to a search engine. You're reading a hashtag for climate hoax, you're reading a hashtag for climate change. Somebody on Facebook posted something that probably already believes in what you believe in anyway, so they're just going to reaffirm your position. So what do we know? That you have to be critical. We also know that students across socioeconomic divides, all of them don't read with a critical eye. I mean, just the uh, Lou et al. study in RRQ recently, yeah. There are differences on, you know, based in their socioeconomic status, but the basic thing is all of them didn't do it well. Um, and we have to think about it being the social nature in the academic discourses. Critical social complexity of text is essential in academic discourses. Because the text, this is an academic discourse right now. And we're having all these texts thrown at us. And so we need to train kids that can handle that kind of academic discourses. We also know that checklists don't always work. I mean, we get these kids with metacognitive <laughs> checklists all the time. Um, it has an author, it has an EDU page, it must be true. All they're doing is parroting back these, these stupid metacognitive lists. And so it, it can't be those alone. Metacognitive checklists alone, can't, we can't strip the context. And that's what I think about. These strategies it isn't strategies, you know, it's not just strategy exchange. We're basically sharing strategies. And we know that when kids work together that they will do better because the checklist alone won't work. So we need social situations where they read. 
Trying to assess kids in online reading comprehension when they can't talk to each other or talk to somebody on the computer? How fake is that? Um, and so we have to get into the idea that texts, socially complex texts, are collaborative texts. And we're going to work on them together. We're gonna, they're going to unfold together. And we're going to fold them up and package them and share them and curate them together. Social curation, I think, is the future of the web. It is the future of instructional texts. Because we need help. And I think the self programming warrior knows how to find help with instructional texts. If I, the other day, I just got a note from here, I'm trying to figure out how to do something, I know to go to YouTube and be like, oh, I can do this. I get up the emails from my students all the time. Uh, Dr. Mack, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm like, did you try Googling it yet? Have you looked on YouTube? Why are you emailing me? Um, and we have to build that future together. So we know that socially constructed texts work better in a production-centered environment. When kids are producing as designers, readers as designers, as navigators, that's where socially complex texts unfold. And if we're working together, we can solve puzzles. And a socially complex text is a puzzle of meaning. But it isn't determined as we try to square a circle. We have to examine those issues, decide the, the credibility of the source, and use those texts in some kind of production-centered way that we're going to really be able to square this circle. And one example that I've used is I've given kids think alouds, but they then have to take, we record each other's think alouds, then they then have to annotate them in a tool and say, this is what I've noticed you doing. And then they talk about those in kind of some kind of dialogical deconstruction of that think aloud. If you're not getting a production-based reading <coughs> analysis, you're not getting it. Because it's we know. Text-based talk and text-based analysis. We've got to talk about the crap that we read. And when we do that, we read that crap better. And we'll be able to tell when it's crap and when it's an instructional text. Um, so that's really the idea. If we want to grow those ideas, we have to really get at that element. So thank you very much.